who is a civil rights lawyer based in Washington, D.C., and is the current senior program director of voting rights at the Leadership Conference on Human Rights. She previously served in the Obama administration as a director of the, of the Department, of, Department Office of Civil Rights in the United States Department of Transportation. She also led the Washington office for the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, where she devised strategies regarding civil, civil rights legislation, monitored federal agency action involving civil rights, and evaluated federal court nominations. During your tenure, she also worked with Congress to reauthorize the Voting Rights Act. It is my pleasure to welcome Ms. Prohl to the discussion today. Last, but certainly not least, we have Professor Sarah Trembath, a faculty member in the Department of Literature from American University, a Dean's D Diversity, Equity, and Inclusivity Fellow in the Colleges of Arts and Science, and a doctoral candidate in the School of Education's Leadership and Policy Program. She is an acclaimed author of two books, It Was the Scarlet That Did It, and This Past Was Waiting For Me. As an educator for 25 years, Trembeth has helped countless students express their critical thinking through informational literacy and writing. Trimbeth's current research focuses on culturally biased educational materials and how it preempts critical thinking and cross-cultural understanding, two critical components of a healthy functioning democracy. Professor Trimbath, thank you very much for attending today's discussion. Thank you. And with that, I have fully introduced all of our panelists. And with that, we will begin with opening remarks from each panelist, and we'll do so in the order in which I've introduced my panelists. Each panelist will be given five minutes to discuss the issue at large and their thoughts on the matter. And so for, with that, we will begin with Representative, Representative Ron Reynolds. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm honored to be on this esteemed panel today. I wanna thank IMPACT for hosting this most important dialogue because as we've seen uh, in this country over the last decade, particularly, we've seen a mass movement and mobilization from the far right to stoke fears of angst in people that has caused a record number of hate crimes uh, committed against people of color, Muslims, African-Americans, Asians, uh, and, his, and Latinos, and also uh, more attacks on the LGBTQ community. So this conversation uh, is timely, and it is time to address it full hand. There's no both sides argument. This, 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 this discussion right here is being fueled from the far right. It is being fueled from the MAGA movement. It is normalized by former President Donald Trump. He basically embraced it. He welcomed it. He invited it to his dinner table. And most recently, uh, it was widely known that he had a white supremacist neo-Nazi at dinner with Kanye West. Uh, and so it's very troubling, someone who once served as president and is a candidate for president right now and leading contender of the Republican Party has embraced this theory. This theory is based on uh, false information. It is uh, really people who are uh, uh, insecure about and not able to embrace the fact that we, we are more diverse in this country. This country was, first of all, it was built on the backs of immigrants. This is a nation of immigrants. And uh, unfortunately, some people aren't comfortable with the fact that we live in a country that is very diverse now with people from all over the world that call the United States home. And many of those people are uh, becoming citizens and exercising their constitutional right to vote. And so uh, unfortunately, uh, because of this false information that I will say is being uh, fear mongered on mainstream media, including Fox News. I'm just gonna be transparent and call it for what it is. Uh, the Tucker Carson's of the world, the Sean Hannity's of the world, the talk radio, when Russ Limbaugh had the number one talk radio show, he's deceased now, uh, but he, uh, you know, espoused it. There are others uh, who, you know, who embrace it. And this is the notion that uh, the, the liberals are allowing uh, these, these immigrants to come into the country, uh, these Muslims, uh, these people from other countries, and they're coming here and they, to be indoctrinated so that they can get uh, more liberals elected, so that, that they're, they're coming here taking our jobs uh, because of these affirmative action programs. And states like I'm in, 
uh, where I'm the chair of the, I'm actually currently chair of the Texas Legislative Black Caucus. Uh, we see Governor Abbott seem to be embracing this because just recently during Black History Month, uh, he announced that no longer could state universities and colleges use diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI policies in the state. He said that they were unconstitutional. Well, first of all, it's totally false. Uh, no, there's been no Supreme Court decision. There's been no guidance uh, from the Department of Education. There's been no guidance from Congress. This is a, another attempt to stoke partisan uh, political points from the far right uh, uh, in a competition with Governor Ron DeSantis in Florida, who is espousing the same policies. So it's incumbent upon us to speak truth to power and to speak out and to educate the public against this very dangerous notion that is being perpetuated by the far right for political gain. They know it's false. They know that this information is, is unfounded, but it, it, it plays to ignorant folks that don't read. It plays to ignorant folks that get their news and their information from Fox and they get their information from talk radio because they're fueling it. Just like we just found out that Fox News knew that this whole voter uh, election fraud nonsense was fake. They, they perpetuated it because they wanted the ratings by telling their audience what they wanted to hear. That President Biden did not win the election, but it was voter fraud. And so we have to hit this head on. We had a president that said at the Charlottesville that there were five people on both sides. In other words, embracing neo-Nazis, telling some of the other folks uh, to stand up and stand down the, in, term, in reference to the Proud Boys and not calling these people out for what they are. These people are neo-Nazi, racist, xenophobics. And so this discussion is timely and I hope that we will wake up the social consciousness of people of good consciousness said that not on our watch will we allow America to go back to the days of Jim Crow, where we had these laws that you talked about uh, in terms of how many bubbles in the bar soap and all other kind of racial barriers. We cannot allow our country to go back. And that is why I'm so excited to be on this panel today to speak truth to power and to make it plain so that folks understand the significance of these local, state, and national elections. Thank you. Thank you very much for your opening statements, Ra, Representative Reynolds. I am so glad to see that you're passionate about the subject at hand. I'm really glad that you're here today. And with that, uh, we'll move on to our next opening remark from Ms. Pearl. Sure. So thank you so much for inviting me. And it's um, an honor to be on this panel. Um, I wanted to come at this um, uh, a theory from the, from the voting rights context in particular. And, uh, you know, fundamentally, ultimately, this is about trying to curtail increasing um, political power of communities of color, right? And Representative Reynolds talked about the last 10 years. I'm going to, I'm going to give you a, a frame for that that matches that. And I'm going to, I'm going to assert that it's the Supreme Court and it's it is, and it's rolling back voting rights that have actually enabled this theory to um, be so prominent within the voting rights context. And that is because 10 years ago, the Supreme Court in a case from Alabama called Shelby County versus Holder gutted the heart of the Voting Rights Act as Representative John Lewis um, uh, would often say. And this was a provision that required states and jurisdictions with histories of voting discrimination, like the state of Texas, like the state of Alabama, to pre-clear voting changes before they were enacted. They had the burden of showing they were non-discriminatory rather than having them be adopted and F's having to challenge them afterwards. It was something that Congress adopted in 1965, okay? The Supreme Court gutted that provision. After that happened, state legislatures in the South, including in Texas, the ink wasn't even dry yet on the opinion before they passed a photo ID law and a whole bunch of other voter restrictions. They have kept it up ever since. And what is happening is you have a cumulative harm 
from all of these pieces of legislation because they did it in 2013 and they're still doing it. Representative Reynolds, I just wrote that the legislature now wants to eliminate polling places on college campuses. Um, if you had had this check under the Voting Rights Act in place that the Supreme Court had gutted, they could not do that without having to go through the Department of Justice to make sure it was not discriminatory. So you have a 10 year period where you have had all kinds of voter restrictions and not just rolling back early voting and you know expanding voter purges. We've now seen things like election subversion where legislatures are passing provisions that impose partisan actors into the voting process, which has never been the case before, uh, taking away power of local election officials to um, operate their, their elections. We're seeing increased threats towards election workers and voters in particular. Um, we're seeing the, the criminalization of voters. You have Governor DeSantis in Florida who established an election integrity unit that went out and arrested Floridians who had felony convictions but had been told by the state of Florida that they could vote. And they had to hire lawyers and, you know, hopefully they're going to have those convictions or the the um, uh, the prosecutions dismissed. But you're also seeing it in the redistricting context um, where you have the 2020 census being used to to um, um, buy by white voters and 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 by white legislators who know that there have been incredible gains in the strength and and political power of communities of color but nevertheless are passing state and congressional maps that restrict um, and dilute the strength of, of of voters of color and Representative Reynolds. I was I was telling him before before we got started that Texas has just so many examples. But I'm thinking about the Texas redistricting. I believe it was the state redistricting that your legislature did, where there was a there was a 95 percent increase in the strength, the political strength, um, political power of voters of color in Texas, yet the, the state legislature enacted state legislative maps that actually increased the number of white districts and the Justice Department sued and a number of civil rights organizations sued. So you have all these different forms um, of, of voter discrimination, of interfering with the political process that, that really show no signs of slowing down. I mean, after the, you know, the 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 big lie in 2020 fueled you know, an incredible number of state voter restrictions in 2021 and 2022. And, and we had not seen that many since the Jim Crow era itself, right? The Brennan Center today, today just issued a report saying there are, let me see, just this year, just this year, Lawmakers in 32 states have introduced or pre-filed at least 150 bills aimed at making it harder to vote. The number of proposed bills represents an uptick in comparison to those introduced in 2021 and 2022, where we had already we'd already seen more than we had ever seen since the Jim Crow era. So we've got two Supreme Court cases on voting rights that were anticipating um, uh, uh, opinions in by June. So there's more threats even um, to us. And so I'm working with a coalition of national, state, and local organizations to try to get the John Lewis bill um, um, passed. It's, you know, prospects are dim because there's a divided Congress, but this fight isn't over. Um, we will be fighting until we get the Voting Rights Act restored to its full strength that Congress gave it back in 1965. And I just hope everyone listening to this will join us, will join us in this fight because we need every single one of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Pearl, for your opening remarks and for our last panelist. 
Hi, thank you. Thank you so much for having me, uh, MPAC. I want to start off by saying I had the extreme honor of being uh, asked to participate by one of my former students. I always feel like that's the biggest endorsement of my work that I can receive, and so I'm grateful to her for reaching out. And I'm grateful to the panelists. You, you set up my, my discussion really nicely. Um, I am a rhetorician, meaning I study the way people say what they say. And in the past 10 years or so, I've been quite alarmed at my students' uh, lack of ability, I would have to say, to think critically. And the profound Eurocentrism of the body of knowledge that they're coming to college with, um, I would have thought that I graduated from high school back in 1987, and I would have thought that um, by now people would be um, much more multicultural in their thinking, much more aware of the way the world works. But I was noticing um, a really sort of disturbing trend with Eurocentrism and Anglocentrism, and most importantly, the inability to think critically about it. Um, and so <clears throat> I started to research the problem, and it took me back to social studies uh, textbooks. And I've read dozens of social studies textbooks and found that a lot of the indoctrination begins there. So um, as Representative Reynolds pointed out, if the Trump administration, administration popularized and legitimized white supremacy like the uh, Great Replacement Theory or if the rollback of the Voting Rights Act enabled it, um, my students' educational experiences have done very little to help them understand what's going on to help them think critically about it and to help them combat it. Um, social studies education is always linked with preparing people for democracy, but I would argue that so is critical thinking. If you have a populace that can't think critically about the issues that are before it, then it will buy everything that Representative Reynolds and uh, Rafay said, that indoctrination, that um, <laughs> talk show wisdom, right? Like all of the rhetoric coming from politicians. And Representative Reynolds, I wanted to thank you for mentioning people's emotional reactions, right? When people take in information, they're supposed to be able to separate their emotional reaction from something to the logic that it carries, right? Like people should be listening to the great replacement theory and saying, what a bunch of garbage that makes no sense, right? So why aren't they being prepared for that by their educations? That's a simple matter of being able to analyze rhetoric to say, okay, well, uh, I'm, I'm Googling around the internet and I decided to read this, uh, this website. How do I know it's telling me the truth, right? Is it, does it, cohere logically internally? Does its rhetoric incite me more than persuade me? Um, is, it, is it supported by fact? What are the sources it's using, right? This is all critical information literacy. And in my field of education, the back and forth in policy is really interesting. Um, I, I went back to, to school when I was 50 <laughs> because it was so alarming to me that I thought, um, I really want to be much more influential on a bigger level. I've been teaching rhetorical analysis and critical thinking in my in my research and writing classrooms for a very long time. But as I'm watching people and <laughs> Governor DeSantis keeps getting named, he's on my list too, right? Like I'm watching um, people legislate against critical thinking. I mean, literally, when laws are telling us which narrative to believe and how teachers should teach it, which is what, um, I, you know, I read the laws <clears throat> and some of them are, are saying that teachers have to teach this and that they can't express their opinion, right? The laws are calling it objective, but rhetoricians know there is no such thing as objective. It's just your opinion. It's, it's a narrative you grew up on and the one um, that you agree with. And I, I agree, um, with Representative Reynolds, that they, they know what they're doing. They know that, that they're indoctrinating while accusing other people of indoctrinating. But what I believe the most hopeful spot in all of this from my perspective is that if people are armed with the ability to think critically, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what rhetoric politicians are using, what textbooks people are putting in front of them because they always have their free will to question. So that's where I'm contributing to, um, to this, to the real, very real fight for democracy. Thank you. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much for your opening remarks, Professor Trembeth. And with that, I find it especially intriguing that we talk about being able to parse between fact and fiction and how that's become more difficult, to say the least, in the last few decades or at least recent 10 years or so. And I think that provides an excellent segue towards our first opening questions for our Q&A session. Uh, just as a heads up for our panelists or for our uh, participants, for the next 30 minutes, I'll be engaging in some discussions with my panelists uh, with some questions that we've already written. Although I have already seen some questions uh, pop up in the chat, which I'll be op open to entertaining uh, towards the latter end of the Q&A session when we have time and if time permits for it. But with that being said, uh, but my first question is directed to you, Professor Trembath. Um, we talked a bit more about the rhetoric of things and how things are you know, being conveyed in terms of the great replacement theory. Although great replacement rhetoric is nothing new, uh, what do you believe is the ideological appeal for its rapidly growing support in the last decade? Uh, what does this say about the state of critical thinking and cross-cultural understanding in our academic in institutions and really American society at large? I think that the appeal is, I think it's largely emotional. I think it comes across as ideological. I mean, it certainly is an ideology. I feel like it appeals to people's sense of belonging. I feel like the, the fear mongering that is going on in terms of um, immigration in particular and um, critical race theory, right, which really is a very logical theory. <laughs> um, I, my experience with talking to people who are struggling with critical thinking, but also with understanding that there, that other people have different histories and different experiences is that their response is very embodied. Um, recent research shows that when people uh, experience a historical narrative different than the one that they were raised with, their fight or flight response goes off. <laughs> which, which was it explained a lot of things that go on in my classroom, but um, I think it's I think it's much more deeply embedded in people and that um, the great replacement theory helps people to um, release an anxiety that they have that they aren't prepared by their educations or by public discourse to to wrestle with in a more intellectual way. Thank you very much for sharing your response, uh, Professor Trimbeth. Uh, I believe it is very insightful that in the sense that when we have a sense of belonging, I believe it does incite a flight or flight response and it does prompt people to, I guess, flee towards a comfortable ideology that makes them feel like to have that cultural sense of belonging in American society, which I feel like would transition really well to the next question I presented for Representative Reynolds. Um, one of the underlying premises in the Great Replacement Theory is that non-Indigenous groups engage with the political system in a really singular uniform way. They tend to fo vote for you know, left-wing politicians, or they tend to vote in a specific way or engage in the political system in such a way that it would provide a demographic, demographic imbalance for those who are deemed traditional in American society. And so given this belief, how damaging do you think this is to our political discourse? And how have you seen this great replacement rhetoric spread within your own community? I, I've seen the great replacement theory spread uh, very rampant over the last several years. It seems to be getting worse and worse. Uh, and we see now where we have a a system that is 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 trying to etch a sketch and erase actual history. That's where critical race theory, where you can't talk about slavery, you can't talk about uh, the many of the atrocities that's happened in this country that 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 led to many of the disparities that exist today. And so this. This notion of the, 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 the great replacement theory is embraced by people who are in mainstream, people who are in Congress right now. That should not happen. We can't normalize this. Uh, and the way that it's being reinforced, again, and I don't want to be sound redundant, but I'm going to be be just because it is what it is, through, through outlets like Fox News that every day they're legitimizing these conspiracy theories, this nonsense that they know is not true. But when people are frustrated, they're upset because of their own personal circumstances, maybe because they didn't get an education. Maybe uh, they haven't uh, achieved the successes that they wanted to achieve. They're blaming immigrants. They're blaming Blacks and Hispanics because, because of them, 
I don't have a job anymore. So they're, they're, they're playing to people's emotions and it's working. And, uh, you know, former President Trump was the ring leader in, in, in flaming, uh, putting fuel on the, on the flame, right? He, he basically was talking to their issues, even though he probably didn't believe it, he was using it for his own political game because it mobilized them to vote and it mobilized them to vote for him. And now these same politicians, uh, these are the same people that uh, stormed the Capitol on January 6th as insurrectionists because they believed it. They, they, they went head first, even if it meant that they were going to overthrow their own government because they believed that they were part of a cause and they were patriots. These people believe that they're doing the patriotic duty to take their country back. Take it back to what? Take it back to white supremacy. I mean, that's what it is. This is white supremacy. This is people who are, they are frustrated and they were more comfortable. When you say make America great again, that's cold for when it was ran by, you know, white, mainly white men. And so they can't fathom the fact that there's diversity uh, in, in Congress, diversity uh, in state houses, that, that we had an African-American. A lot of this stuff was birthed out of the 2008 when Barack Obama became president because that's what started the Tea Party. And it's just, it's just gotten worse ever since then. That's when it really kind of ramped up. And so we have a duty to be able to educate the public that this is false, that this information is very dangerous. And the FBI has seen a rise in domestic terrorism, but what they don't want to focus on it. They want to focus on, uh, it's, it's, they're more comfortable focusing on Muslim extremists, right? Uh, that, 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 that invaded the country on 9-11. They're more comfortable talking about that than the white supremacist domestic terrorism that stormed the Capitol on January 6th. We're seeing much more of that than we have for 9-11. And so they don't want to talk about that because unfortunately, the truth is many of them are voting in the Republican primary and they're comfortable because they believe that those people are, are responsible for their elections. And so sometimes we have to be statesmen and put people before politics and, and do what, it, what is necessary. That happened with uh, Liz Cheney. She was a, a patriot and truly spoke out about things. Unfortunately for her, she, she, she lost her election, but she told the truth about election fraud, about the fact that there was none. So we have a duty, not just as African-Americans or Muslims or, his, or minorities, but we have to appeal. And I'll say this final thing about this. When John Lewis, his name was mentioned earlier, and I'm, I'm happy, I think it was Leslie, mentioned John Lewis, former, former congressman, uh, who made good trouble, who made many sacrifices as a young man to break down barriers of Jim Crow laws that prohibited African-Americans per, per, mainly from voting. Well, it wasn't until Bloody Sunday when he was beaten to a pump on national TV and people saw how he was met with violence as a nonviolent, basically, who was trying to basically peacefully protest, right? Marching for voting rights. They saw him beating nearly to death. That raised the social consciousness where it wasn't just an African-American plight anymore, but white people, other people of good conscience said, not in our country, we will continue to allow this. That ultimately led to the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1964, and I mean, the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65. We have to birth that same kind of spirit of inclusion of non-minority people that say enough is enough. This is ridiculous. Not on our watch will we allow our country to go back to those dark days of, of separatism, uh, white nationalist, KKK, xenophobic type of mentality. And, and it takes more people like Liz Cheney. It takes more people uh, that, that, that believe that America should be diverse and open and inclusive to be able to get us to a place where we can continue to advance and not go backwards. Thank you so much for your response, Rep Representative Reynolds. I find your comments about internal frustration to be especially insightful, seeing that that is a main driver in creating legislation that ultimately discriminates against people of color, especially African-Americans. 
which I believe feeds really well into our next question for Ms. Prohl. Uh, now, previously, as you've alluded to in your opening statement, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund worked on a case Shelby County v. Uh, Holder in which the Supreme Court ruled that Section 5 and 4B of the Voting Rights Act as are unconstitutional. According to the Brennan Center of, for Justice, states covered by this section at the time of the decision included Texas, Louisiana, Alabama, and other Southern states with traditionally large African-American populations. In your view, how impactful has this decision been for American race relations in the past decade? And in what ways has this decision leg legitimized support for the Great Replacement Theory? Oh, Leslie, I think you're muted. Sorry, sorry. I think it's been the most devastating blow to democracy in the modern era. It, it really took the sail out of the Voting Rights Act in a way that affected not only state legislatures and everything we've talked about in terms of what they've done in the past 10 years, but local, local legislative bodies who decide to close polling locations in Black neighborhoods um, and before would have had to have sought approval of that of that action before the Justice Department no longer no longer did it. We did a study in 2017 that that most of the polling places closed after Shelby County were in predominantly um, um, communities of color in in previously covered jurisdictions under Section Five of the Voting Rights Act. Um, I think it is it is hard to fathom just how much harm has been caused by this decision. It is we're 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 I mean it, it, as a voting rights lawyer, I every day we try to wrap our heads around everything that's going on. It's it's very different to quantify. Very, very, very difficult, I mean, to quantify. But the other thing is these these impacts are cumulative. I mean, we talk about, you know, Texas will do something one year and, and it'll get covered. And then when the election happens, there will be a tie back to see what the impact of that law was on voting, right? And even though, even though there's turnout, right? There's still racial gaps in turnout almost everywhere, okay? So that's that election. Then we move forward to the next election. In the meantime, that Texas will probably pass another voter restriction law in some other form. The next election, they will talk about what just happened. I want them to talk about all the ones that they've passed since 2013, because that is cumulatively decreasing the ability of voters to participate, not one-offs. It's a combined kind of force that's even larger than the individual acts, right? And so I think we have to talk about it in, in that term. Also, that voting discrimination is changing form. It is, it looks very different now than it did than it did five years ago. We still have those old tactics and they're not going away. I mean, talk about the closing of the polling places on college campuses, but they're still trying that, but it's taking new shapes and forms that we don't even know what they're thinking of next until they come up with it. And then we have to try to sue after the fact it's been passed. Um, the second part of your question was, how does this fit in with the theory? I think it's 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 enabling. It is a primary enabling tool because it shows it shows exactly where um, uh, black political power, um, political power of communities of color is concentrated, and then the the act to restrict the vote is targeted at those communities. It's not. It's not something that that universally applies, and you know, poor white um, rural voters are are also swept up in it in the same in the same respect. They're usually not. There's you know, you, under the Voting Rights Act, you you have to show at least that it disproportionately affects communities of color 
and 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 we're able to prove that in a lot of these instances right but we also are able to prove in in some instances that it's intentionally discriminatory and so there it's like a it's like a heat seeking action and it looks to see you know and there are you know very able to be documented where there are increases in in power and where there are about to be increases in power the forces come out surround those jurisdictions and make sure that they're not getting those gains and so it fits i think squarely into this theory that it, this is a zero sum game and that that their win is our loss and we need to protect our political power at any cost Ms. Prohl, thank you very much for your response. I, I also find it particularly insightful in that we describe the decision as enabling, enabling for those who are um, advocating for the Great Replacement Theory to have voter discrimination laws that affect people of color, that affect African-American communities um, across the nation. And I think it is worthy of us to take a step back and see just the scope of such um, ambition being done throughout the United States. And so for this, I have a question directed towards Representative Reynolds. Um, Recent studies have shown that as many as 61% of Trump voters in the 2020 election agree, at least in part, with principles of the Great Replacement Theory. In your experience, are there any mainstream candidates or elected officials within Texas or just in general that, you, that you're aware about who are talking about restricting voter access? And what are their general views on immigration? Sadly, um, there are. And sadly, many of them uh, are in leadership positions uh, in the state. Uh, for example, it's documented that our Lieutenant Governor said of Haitian migrants arriving at the border, this is trying to take over our country. You know, that, that, that's very dangerous. I mean, this, this, is, this is our Lieutenant Governor, uh, one of the most powerful positions in state government. Uh, it, he, he runs the Senate. Uh, we have Governor you know, Abbott, who, like I said earlier, just uh, eradicated uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in the most diverse state where African Americans have more African Americans in Texas per the 2020 census than any other state. Per the 2020 census, 95% of the growth was because of Asians, African Americans, and Hispanics. 95%. Yet Leslie knows that when they did redistricting, they gerrymandered so that they would dilute those communities for being able to elect candidates of their choice. So they're afraid of the growing demographics and they continue to inflame uh, these, these notions. When we had uh, a debate on the House floor last session about critical race theory, uh, all Republicans voted yes, all Democrats voted no. Uh, and many of those same, it was the same vote uh, for the voter uh, uh, restriction uh, what I call Jim Crow 2.0 bill, Senate Bill 1, which uh, there was a straight party line vote and they were not trying to make our elections more secure. They were trying to make it more difficult for traditional immigrants, black and brown people to vote. So we have a problem in this state and in, and in this country uh, that is they're trying to conform to the MAGA movement because they believe that's what it takes for them to win Republican primaries. And because of gerrymandering, very few seats are competitive. Uh, they're drawn with a partisan edge, a strong partisan edge. So there's no real purple seats. They're either extreme Democrat or extreme Republican, not middle ground. So that they, they, they tend to, their elections tend to be over with after the primary. And based on the primary, uh, a lot of times it's the contest to see who can say the wackiest farthest extreme positions. Those are the ones that unfortunately tend to win that spout these conspiracy theories. So the Marjorie Taylor Greens, they shouldn't be winning elections. Uh, these people should be losing, but they're winning and they're winning in Texas. We have, uh, you know, our own people, Brian Babbitt, he said this, uh, they want to change America. They want to replace the American electorate with third party immigrants that are coming in illegally. That's a US Congressman out of Texas, Rep Representative uh, Brian Babbitt. So yes, people in Congress, uh, in leadership positions, uh, in state government out of Texas are making these false, uh, inflaming, uh, discriminatory, xenophobic, racist 
statements based on paranoia and people are embracing them as fact and we're getting these bad laws on the books because of it. We're getting these, that, that people are trying to steal elections, that people are trying to indoctrinate our kids, that people are trying to, uh, uh, you know, embrace uh, LGBTQ. They want to change, uh, they want to convert your children to be gays and lesbian. That's the kind of nonsense that, that we're getting from our own officials. So the point you're making is well suited that we have these people in public office now, and it's up to the electorate to vote them out of office. It's up to the electorate to say enough is enough. Not on our watch when we continue to reelect you when you hold these principles that the majority of Texans disagree with. These are the same people that made it harder to vote and easier to purchase a gun. Like, you know, they made it easy to purchase a gun because they lifted restrictions on even having a permit but they made it harder to vote, which is the bedrock of our democracy. So I'm outraged by it. I see it. And, and, and some of these people call themselves Christians and they, 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 they hide on the cloak that they're conservatives and they're Christians and they don't want gambling because it's immoral. But these are the same people that discriminate against people that don't look like them. People who look like you, like me, like the majority of the state, they discriminate against them every single day with these policies because they want to, they're fearful that they may uh, hold public office and they may no longer be in power. And that's what it boils down to, power, retaining power, and then they can then win by playing on people's ignorance and spreading false information, then that's what they do. Representative Reynolds, thank you very much for your response. I, I especially find it important that as American, as the Americans, we should be very vigilant in voting out those who espouse these ideologies and these principles that are very uh, bigoted towards people of color and African Americans. Uh, I do find it important that even through that vigilance, it is important that voting rights are protected for people to do so and, and be able to exercise the critical right, which I believe leads into our next question that I have prepared for Ms. Prohl. Um, in the past 50 years, the judiciary has been essential for upholding fundamental civil liberties within the African-American community, as in Brown v. Board of Education, Loving v. Virginia, and other landmark cases. Uh, in your view, what role does the judiciary play in safeguarding voting rights protections for African-Americans, and how can proponents of the Great Replacement Theory exploit this position for discriminatory ends? Wow, that's a great question. Um, look, the, the courts have always been integral to enforcing civil rights, but in particular, um, voting rights. I mean, I'm, you know, the Voting Rights Act is only as strong as the courts who will enforce it, right? And over the years, there have been, you know, seminal cases um, making sure that its power is recognized and 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 implemented. And I think this um, um, this this recent court um, has really become the most hostile court ever in terms of um, trying to undermine the Voting Rights Act and um, repeatedly um, um, attack the statute. Um, it's not only Shelby County. There was a case a couple years ago um, with the remaining provision, Section 2, um, where you have where you can sue um, after the fact, um, um, complain about discrimination rather than try to prevent it. And um, it was a it was a case out of Arizona, Bronovich versus DNC. The court severely undermined that provision. We have another case from Alabama that that is going to come out at the end of the term, Merrill versus Milligan, that is about the redistricting that Representative Reynolds talked about, where Alabama has a 27 percent black population has only had one black member of Congress out of seven seats um, forever since 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 1992 when it's got its first black uh, congressperson. And so the plaintiff sued saying we we need to we need at least two black majority districts. Every factor that goes into redistricting principles supports the creation of a second, um, um, majority minority district and a court composed of three judges. Those are the those are the courts that usually hear these types of cases initially. Three judges, two of whom were Trump appointees, 
agreed with the plaintiffs and said that, that black votes were being diluted because of the legislature's refusal to adopt this, this second um, uh, majority black district. And um, the state of Alabama took the case to the Supreme Court. Um, and, and the state of Alabama argued to the Supreme Court that race has no place in redistricting whatsoever. Um, and, and that even if it does have some role, that the, the practices that this three judge court adopted for evaluating this are wrong. And therefore Alabama should continue to only have one black Congress. It's a, it's a woman, Terry, Congresswoman Terry Sewell who represents Selma. Um, and so the, here you have an example of this Supreme Court. We don't have the decision yet. We, we, you know, we all filed amicus briefs in the case. We are hopeful that we will pre prevail. But this court has a horrible record on voting rights. And if it rules against um, the second majority Black district here, it will be um, re re replacing, overturning the decision of two Trump judges in a in a three judge court, and so it's it's a very perilous time because um, the the extremist forces, not just the conservative forces, the extremist forces have stolen seats on the Supreme Court, um, and we are probably not gonna. Um, um, have a better court in our lifetime. I, I just hate to say that, but now it's six to three for a very long time. It was five to four and they show no signs of, of uh, slowing down on, on the democracy hits. And so um, whatever happens at the lower courts, and we just had, you know, four years of Trump appointed judges, and many of them were, were very hostile to voting rights. Um, when, we, when we saw their nominations, we opposed them. And in Texas, for example, I just read that there were there are 18 uh, Trump judges sitting on the Texas district courts. Those are the judges that hear the voting rights cases first. Um, and so we're in a very perilous time, very perilous. It's why what Biden has done on judges um, has been so magnificent. He's finally nominating voting rights lawyers and civil rights lawyers and public defenders to the bench. Um, but they are using the courts. Um, to their great advantage, and it is absolutely a travesty of justice. Cool. Thank you very much for your response. Uh, in the interest of time, we will be addressing two more questions. We'll be taking one more from my pre-prepared -pre list, and I'll be turning to the audience and trying to use um, their Q&A questions with regards to the solutions that we can make with, re with respect to the discriminatory ends that we've discussed previously. And so for this and to these ends, uh, we'll refer to uh, Professor Trambath once more. Um, so earlier this month, the College Board announced that they are piloting an AP African American Studies course in 60 U.S. schools next year. However, several states such as Florida have rejected the curriculum because they believe it pushes a partisan agenda premised on critical race theory. Um, in your view, how feasible is it to push great replacement counter narratives in the classroom? And what are some ways to combat statewide suppression on a local level, like a community school board, for example? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I, I spent the morning reading Florida's law again because I'm really trying to see if it really if it really is illegal, even under the, the ridiculous law that, <laughs> that Florida passed. And I, I'm not so sure it is. But um, so there are a couple parts to your question. Um, the one I want to speak to first is about like what can be done in the classroom. Uh, with this really hostile political environment. And Leslie, I think you characterized it perfectly. There's so much going on. It's hard to wrap our heads around. You know, it's like um, dozens of states have tried to pass these laws. 11 have succeeded. Um, there's laws being repealed and then there's laws being passed and then there's laws being modified. And then it's how they trickle down to the various um, districts and how it plays out in classrooms. I mean, it is it is hard. It is, they are hitting us on so many different fronts. Um, but in the classroom, I find that um, it's it's important to emphasize critical thinking because it when a teacher is in a classroom and is encouraging students to 
wonder things and to research things and to ask questions about things that's not illegal yet <laughs> it's discouraged most um it's, it's discouraged in the florida law more than in any other law that i've read because the florida law is very specific that teachers shall not deviate in certain ways from what's prescribed but for the most part i think teachers can still encourage people to question that you can stick to your mandated materials and that you can stick to um, the core standards that the state puts down before you um, but if you are asking students if you're facilitating if you have an environment in which you can still have students thinking critically that is not yet illegal and i think that's the main thing i think if they could make it illegal they would um <clears throat> and i and i do think that they're trying i also think that people need to understand the difference between what the laws actually say and what the political rhetoric is i think representative reynolds spoke beautifully to that there's so much dramatic political rhetoric and in many cases, this is going to be surprising, in many cases, the laws restricting critical race theory are not quite as restrictive as the far right wants us to think. Um, they know that people aren't going to sit down and read, like the Florida law is 30 single space pages, right, of legal language. <laughs> and so they know people aren't going to sit down and read that. So I'm clear, because when you, when you pull down a law off the internet, what was stricken is is noted and what was changed is underlined and I can see there's a very lively debate going on. Democrats are absolutely <laughs> fighting hard and so whatever they put out they're not often getting 100% of what they want, but then DeSantis can jump on TV and he can say whatever he wants and scare teachers. It's very clear that teachers are scared. They're quitting. They don't know what to believe. They don't actually know what they're allowed to do and what they aren't allowed to do. Um, so there's a big difference between the political rhetoric and what the law actually says. Um, I have tons more I could say about it, but I don't want to take up all your time. I hope I <laughs> addressed your question. Of course you have. So no worries about that. Mm -hmm. um, in the interest of time, uh, I, I do understand I didn't mention about going through the Q&A uh, from the chat. But what I will do is, in the interest of time for all of our panelists, we will begin our closing statements, but I will try to refer to the Q&A question as sort of like a guide towards uh, how we're going to frame our statements. And so, Professor Trimbath, my understanding is you do have a commitment or meeting to make in the next few minutes, so I'll have you begin your three-minute closing statement. And in doing so, uh, I would like if you can try to address the general sense I'm getting from the Q&A questions here. But the, the general question is, you know, how can we as Americans fight uh, for voting rights and protections within our own communities? And how can organizations such as Impact? what steps can we take to um, assist people on those ends? Thank you. Um, I'll be really quick. Uh, I think that knowledge is power. And I think it's important to uh, combat the political rhetoric by understanding what's what. I would recommend that people familiarize themselves with what critical race theory actually is and isn't. And for that, they would go to Gloria Letts and Billings. Um, she's the premier critical race theorist who um, she's, a, she's an educator, she's a teacher educator, and she's a social studies researcher. And it's her 2000 three work that um, started the well it drove forward the revolution in social studies to teach critically and to teach uh, multiculturally in an important way um, it is not what politicians uh, say it is um, the other thing that i would encourage people to do is to read the laws that are um, relevant to their state you can go on the internet and you can find out whether your state is one of the states that has passed one of these laws and and empower yourself to understand what your what you're allowed to do what your kids are allowed to do and what they're not it's uh, you might be surprised at what you, what you find thank you very much for sharing your closing statements professor uh, professor trembath and with that i will transition to uh, miss pearl to give her last um, remarks Sure. So let's look, in terms of what to do, first of all, I work for a civil rights coalition. We've got 230 organizations. Our, um, our universe is the entire country. Please go to our website, civilrights.org. There are ways you can plug into our voting program. We have an excellent campaign called And Still I Vote. Um, you can add your name in there and get emails and updates about what's going on 
nationally at the state and 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 hopefully at the local level um there's an opportunity here to start engaging there are certainly elections every year right it's not just the midterm it's not just the presidential a lot of decisions are being made at the at the state and local level so participate right now there's 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 efforts that need you in terms of beating back these bad bills. There are also some really good bills, depending on where you are. Connecticut, Minnesota, uh, New Jersey, New York, they're passing really positive pro-voter bills. And so I would encourage you to get engaged now and then certainly in the lead up to the next election, um, you know, build out your own community and make sure everyone is participating. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Pearl. Uh, Representative Reynolds. Well, thank you. I, I've enjoyed uh, this conversation this evening. And I think my call to action would be uh, to remember um, the words for Dr. King, where he gave us all a challenge, where he said, the life's most urgent and persistent question is not, is what are you doing for others? So I think that all of us have a, a duty to answer that call. How do we, how do we help others? How do we make it better because we're all benefiting from previous generations and the sacrifices that were made. Uh, we stand on their shoulders. And so I hope that we will use our time, our talent, our treasure to encourage people to vote. Elections matter, elections have consequences. We, uh, uh, getting people registered, uh, educating people about the issues, uh, volunteering uh, with some of your civic organizations. Uh, it is so important uh, that you get involved in your communities, get involved in other organizations that Leslie just articulated. There's so many organizations like Impact. I just encourage people to volunteer, uh, to make donations. Uh, these, some of them are charitable, some of them are, you know, 501c3 tax deductible, some of them are. But make sure that you're doing your part. We all have responsibility. If we do nothing but complain, it's only going to get worse. Einstein said this, the definition of insanity is to keep doing the same thing and expecting different results. We can't do that. We have to change the paradigm. We have to speak truth to power. Silence is complicity. If you're complaining and you're not voting, then you're part of the problem. You're enabling other people to make decisions for you and others because of your inability to vote. And I'll say this finally, it's not just every four years in presidential elections. Your local city council race is so important. Your school board races are often overlooked. These are the people that are really fully indoctrinating a lot of this nonsense about critical race theory. Your county commissioner, your state representative, your state senator, your U.S. congressperson, your judges in places where the judges are elected. Every election counts. So use your voice your vote is your voice. Make your voices heard. Thank you. Thank you very much, Representative Reynolds. And with that, I believe all of our panelists have provided closing remarks. And so with that, I will uh, provide closing remarks on my own but on behalf of MPAC. So on behalf of MPAC, thank you very much to everybody for attending today's webinar. I believe this event today has really emphasized a key, uh, I would say, principle in, in terms of addressing voting rights, especially as it relates to the Great Replacement Theory, and as retaining vigilance and ensuring that we fight for democracy in every way we can. As an organization, MPAC has dedicated the last 12, has dedicated its entire history towards ensuring that we fight for a free and fair democracy for every walk of life in America. Um, in the last eight, six to eight months, we've worked on a series of democracy forums that focus on different aspects in which our institutions have been corroded by uh, bad faith actors, especially as it relates to voting rights. Uh, and in Texas, as our very our own truly, uh, Representative Reynolds has attended for one of our um, forums. And so as an organization, our goal really is to ensure that these kind of efforts retain its importance throughout the year. I know we've especially taken the time during Black History Month to reflect on the rampant voting discrimination being afflicted against African-Americans, against people of color. But this is an issue that always should take center stage because it is an issue that has been ingrained in our history for many decades and in fact, centuries to this point. And it is an issue that to, to the extent that we have yet to like address it fully, we haven't really uh, achieved full equality. And I believe that in that sense, it is really important that for organizations such as ours to mobilize um, and really work with other organizations in achieving those goals. Now, Ms. Pearl, I do wanna emphasize that as an organization, we are very interested in your line of work and, that, um, and how we've 
you know, try to work in terms of fighting for our democracy. So we are more than um, welcome. And we're really excited to see if there are any opportunities that you may present to us, whether it's as an impartial advisor, amicus opportunities in the, in the near future. We would love to work with you in the future in terms of fighting for African-American voting rights, as especially is known that most of Americans comprise a large you know, demographic in the African-American community. And so we definitely find that it is important for us to protect voting rights for everybody, especially for uh, Muslim Americans and African-Americans in our community. So uh, with, wonderful. And so with that, those are all my remarks. Uh, thank you very much for everybody attending today's webinar. I hope you found it as an, it was an insightful discussion with regards to race relations, voting rights, and especially within the last decade, as we've seen the great replacement theory, bringing back some of the old rhetoric that we've seen from the 20th century, the 19th century, and how that's rearing its ugly end in a lot of voting discrimination bills that we've seen. So thank you very much for our very esteemed and wonderful panelists for joining us today. Thank you for all the participants for joining us today. And with that, uh, the event is adjourned. So thank you very much for attending. Thank you. Of course. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you.